Folks, we all know that fighting games have a lot of jargon, they have a lot of slang and terminology that are important to learn if you want to understand what people are talking about when they tell you how to play a game. Uh, but some of this jargon is a little bit confusing. Some of it has people a little bit messed up about what the individual terms and phrases mean. So today, I put the call out on Twitter. I said, what do you think are the most commonly misused or misunderstood terms in fighting games? And I've put together a list of 10. I think these are the 10 fighting game terms that everyone's using wrong. And you guys better stop. You better learn what these really mean so you stop sounding like a fool when I read what you say on Twitter. And to help me out, I'm going to be using the fighting game glossary, glossary.infill.net. Whenever I define a term, I'll just pop up the description for you. Like if you want to know what chicken blocking is, it's right there so you guys can see it. And that is going to be the actual true definition to contrast with a lot of the ways where people are misusing these words and saying them in context where it doesn't really make sense. If you enjoy this kind of content, I would really appreciate it if you could hit the like and subscribe button. It really, really does help me out and uh, lets me know that this is the kind of stuff you like so I can keep making more of it. But with that, let's go to the list, guys. Guys, before we get into it, I want to tell you about the sponsor for today's video, Boxu. Boxu is a Japanese snack box subscription service that sends authentic Japanese snacks straight to your door. And I've got something very exciting to share with you. Boxu is currently running a free Tickets to Japan giveaway. All new and current subscribers before the end of December will automatically be entered, and five lucky winners will get a free pair of tickets to Japan. You know, the snacks and candy in this box can make you feel like you're really in Japan, but now, thanks to Boxu, you can actually go there. Plus, with the holidays coming up, Boxu can make a great gift. You got someone who's hard to shop for. They definitely will not be disappointed with the huge amount of deliciousness contained in each of these themed boxes. So not only do you have the perfect gift, but you also have the chance to win a free trip to Japan for the two of you. So guys, make sure you use the link in the description to pick up your subscription to Boxu. The details and terms and conditions for the contest can be found there as well. Make sure you check it out, and thank you as always to Boxu for helping support the channel. So the first term I wanted to talk about here is priority. So this is kind of like an older school thing. People used to just say this all the time. People would say like, oh, you're crouching heavy kick beat out my crouching jab. So your crouching heavy kick has priority over my crouching jab. It beats it out. Or an even more obvious example, a dragon punch will just go through and beat any move. It just beats everything. So people would say, this is the highest priority move in the game. It has priority over everything. Well, it turns out that's not really how games work. What's actually happening behind the scenes is that every attack has offensive hitboxes and defensive hitboxes, also known as hurtboxes. And if the hitbox overlaps with the hurtbox, you get hit. So some moves have bigger hitboxes, which means it's easier to hit the opponent out of their moves. Some moves have what's called dis jointed hitboxes where the hitbox is very separated from the hurtbox which makes them extremely hard to interrupt or hit the opponent out of and some moves like the shoryuken that we talked about have no hurtbox so you can't be hit out of them or they're also known as invincible now that's not to say that there's literally no such thing as priority in fighting games some games do have a system where you can see normally if we hit each other with medium punches we trade we both get hit but it's actually not possible to trade a jab with a medium punch. The medium punch always wins. And vice versa, a heavy punch will always win the trade versus the medium punch. So the higher strength normal always wins the trade. But that only applies to trading. That only applies to when the moves are on top of each other at the same time. You can still, for example, counter poke medium normals with light normals. But any situation where your buttons would trade, the medium is always going to win because it's the higher strength. So that's what priority means. That doesn't apply to stuff like this where you're just outranging them or invincibility or something like that. That's not priority in action. So stop using the word priority in that way. So next up, I want to talk about the term meaty. So meaty, it's kind of like literally where like it used to mean one thing, but the, the definition has kind of evolved over time. People now say like, I literally died and that's considered grammatically acceptable, even if you're still alive. And in the same way, uh, meaty used to mean something a little different from what it means now. So let's talk about what it used to mean. So the way meaty used to work was it meant hitting the opponent with a late active frame of a move. So whenever you do an attack in a fighting game, the time where the attack is active, meaning it can actually hit the opponent, sometimes lasts multiple frames. So DJ, for example, his crouching medium punch, there are six frames 
where this crouching medium punch is out and able to hit the opponent. But usually you always hit them with the first frame, right? Like as soon as the move becomes active, if it's on top of the opponent, it's going to hit them. So how can you hit them with a late active frame? And it turns out there's one very easy way, and that's when the opponent is waking up. When the opponent is waking up, you can put an attack out, and then they'll stand up into it after the attack has been out for a while. So why would you actually want to do this? Well, one really big reason is for combos. You can see normally it's impossible for DJ to combo crouching medium punch into crouching heavy kick. This combo simply does not work. The frames just don't work out. But if the crouching medium punch hits very meaty, meaning with a late active frame, DJ is going to recover faster while Kami is still being hit by this crouching medium punch. And all of a sudden, the combo works. And meaty is a spectrum, so something can be just a little bit meaty if it hits on like the second or third active frame. Or it can be like super meaty if a move has like 10 active frames and it hits on like the 10th frame. That is ultra mega meaty and you are going to get an insane amount of frame advantage from this. So the most common way to set up a meaty is with a knockdown. But this can also be done with spacing. So moves like Alex crouching heavy punch, he moves forward as he does the move. So you can space it out to make it hit with later frames. And if you don't do this move very meaty, you're not going to be able to get the EX elbow after. But if this hits like really meaty with like a late active frame, you can see you can make the combo work. So another example of this is going to be universal overhead in Street Fighter 3. You can see when I'm close to the opponent, I hit with a pretty early active frame. I kind of hit when Ken is at like the peak of his little hop when he's high off the ground. And generally, if the move hits early like that, you're not going to be able to combo. So you see it says nine hits, which means that we did not combo into the super. But if we hit from far away, we hit with a much, much later active frame. You can see Ken is like well on his way down from the hop when Chun gets hit. And this gives you plenty of time to combo into super. You can see 10 hits. We got the extra hit because the overhead actually comboed. So that is another very common use of hitting meaty, hitting with a late active frame. So how has the use of the word meaty changed? Well, now people use meaty basically any time you hit the opponent right when they're getting up. Any time there's a move on top of the opponent when they're getting up, that's called a meaty. And is this technically incorrect? It's, it's borderline because like, yes, maybe I'm hitting her with a late frame of jab there. Who's to say? But that's not really why I'm doing it. And sometimes you're just hitting with the first frame. So it's a little bit of a misuse to call any attack that is hitting the opponent as they're waking up a meaty, but this is just the way people use it now. People, anytime you knock the opponent down and you hit them like right as they get up, that's called a meaty. So the definition has kind of changed. A lot of people don't even know about that aspect of hitting them with a late active frame. Uh, but you know, language evolves over time. So at this point, we're all just used to it, I guess. So people are gonna continue to call it that. But I think it's important that you know the origin of the term and what the original term means for these situations where hitting with a late active frame actually makes a huge difference. All right, next up, I wanna talk about charge partitioning. So before we talk about what charge partitioning is, I wanna talk about what charge partitioning isn't. So is this charge partitioning? If you look at my inputs, you can see I'm already holding back when I do a sonic boom so I have more time to get charged. No, that's not charge partitioning. Is this charge partitioning where you do a standing normal in between a down to up charge move? No, that's not charge partitioning either. In fact, very, very few games even have charge partitioning. The only ones I know of are this one, Street Fighter 3 Third Strike. Also, Undernight in Birth has it for characters like Batista. And believe it or not, Smash Ultimate has charge partitioning as well for Terry. So what actually is charge partitioning? Well, the idea is that you can interrupt holding charge. So for a move like Yuri and Tackle, you have to hold back and then press forward plus kick. But you can interrupt holding back and the game kind of remembers that you were charging for a certain number of frames. So you can let go of charge, but the game still remembers that you're charging. So you can see with Yurian, I'm able to hold down back for a little bit to start charging, and then I'm able to dash, finish charging at the end, and then do headbutt. Or to show it with tackle, I do back, dash, hold back for a little bit, and then I can finish the charge and do my tackle. So the game remembers the charge 
across two different back inputs even though there's a break in the middle the game remembers that i was charging and this is necessary for a lot of crazy urian combos that i'm not good enough to do so i'll just show you here so usually when people do something like they hold back then they press forward then back plus the attack to get the charge attack sooner and start holding charge immediately that's called charge buffering which is not the same charge partitioning is very rare so it shouldn't come up in 99 percent of fighting games that you play all right, next up, I want to talk about instant overhead. So we all know an overhead is an attack that must be blocked standing. It hits the opponent high. An instant overhead means hitting the opponent on the way up with a jumping attack. So this is called instant because it's instant. It's unreactable. So some of these only work on like large characters, like characters that are bigger than most when they crouch, but some instant overheads work on everybody. So this is not to be confused with a universal overhead, like we already talked about. Street Fighter 3 has universal overheads, as well as Dragon Ball Fighters with Towards Plus Medium. That's universal, because every character can do it. It's a universal mechanic, but it's definitely not instant. And this is also not to be confused with instant air dash, which is air dashing as low as you can in the air. So in a lot of games, you can instant air dash by tapping up forward and then forward. And some games will have a button shortcut that lets you press buttons to air dash. So that will make it really easy to get those air dashes as close as you can off the ground. But again, this is an instant air dash because we're air dashing the second we leave the ground. But it's not an instant overhead because, again, it does take a little bit of time before that jumping attack is going to hit overhead. So next up, I would say this one people say wrong like 99.9% .9 of the time they get it wrong. And this is trip guard. So you know how I was saying that literally can be used kind of as the opposite of its original meaning. That's how the term evolved. Well, this is the same thing is true with trip guard. So the actual meaning of trip guard is essentially that when you jump, you can block the second you land no matter what. So in old games, there was no trip guard, meaning that if you jumped and blocked, you could get anti-aired by a trip or a sweep. There was no trip guard. Even if you just empty jumped, if, even if you don't do an attack in the air, you can still get anti-aired by a trip. But after Street Fighter 2, Capcom introduced trip guard to the Street Fighter series, and pretty much every fighting game now is generally going to allow you to trip guard in some situations, meaning now if you empty jump and they try to anti-air you with the sweep, you will always be able to block it. But if you press an attack in the air, you lose your ability to trip guard. If you attack, you can always be anti-aired with a sweep. So a lot of games now we would say that you can trip guard if you empty jump or the game has trip guard for empty jumps. But if you press an attack, you cannot trip guard. You lose your trip guard when you do an attack. <laughs> but pretty much the way that everybody uses this term now is they just mean tri trip guard just means anti-airing with a sweep or a low. People say, oh, nice trip guard anti-air. That's not really what it means. It, it Guard. Guard is in the word. Trip guard means you can guard. But people will say that the sweep itself is the trip guard, which is a little bit wrong. But at this point, it's too much effort to try to correct people. So it's fine. This is just the way everyone uses it is, oh, nice, nice trip guard there with the uh, crouching medium kick. A good trip guard. But definitely that was not the original meaning. Just ask James Chen. The man knows. All right, next up, we're going to talk about the word Shoto. So the original meaning of Shoto, it was said back in the day that Ryu and Ken used Shotokan karate, a style of karate. They don't really, their moves don't really resemble Shotokan in any way, but that's what the lore said. And so basically any character who was like Ryu or Ken, meaning they have a fireball, they have a hurricane kick, and they have a dragon punch, these were called the Shotos, or the Shotokan characters. So in Street Fighter 2, that was just Ryu, Ken, and Akuma. But as the games went on, things get a little bit more ambiguous. Like, is Sakura a Shoto? She's got a fireball, she's got a hurricane kick, she's got a dragon punch, but she doesn't really play like Ryu and Ken. She can't really do, like, keep away with her fireball. It's not good enough. Her dragon punch has no invincibility. She's much more of a rushdown character who doesn't really have the exact same playstyle as someone like Ryu. But is she a Shoto? A lot of people would say yes. Come to think of it, what about Sagat? I mean, he's got a fireball. He's got an uppercut. 
It's invincible. He's got a forward moving kick attack. You know, maybe you could say that's kind of like a hurricane kick or a Tatsumaki. Uh, but is Sagata Shoto? Personally, I don't think so. But a lot of people think he is. There's a lot of disagreement. If you put two fighting game players in a room, you're not going to be able to get them to agree on which characters technically count as Shotos and which don't. Sagat is a Muay Thai fighter. Dan uses his own style called Psycho. They don't use Shotokan, not even in the lore. And yet, a lot of people would say they're Shotos. But with the advent of Super Smash Brothers, things got even more tricky. When they added Kazuya from Tekken into Super Smash Brothers, a lot of players were like, oh great, they added another Shoto. Listen, Kazuya is not a Shoto. I don't care how you interpret it. Electric Wind God Fist is not a Dragon Punch. Hell Sweep is not a Tatsu. He doesn't have anything resembling a Fireball, okay? Kazuya is not a Shoto. Uh, so don't confuse the word Shoto to mean like main character in a fighting game or like 2D fighting game character. That's not what Shoto means. Shoto means a character who plays like Ryu or Ken. That's the long and short of it. Depending on how much you want to stretch the definition, it can apply to a lot of characters. But unambiguously, I would say a character like Kazuya is not a Shoto. So that's something important to keep in mind. Don't get it twisted, guys. All right, next up, I want to talk about 50-50s and mix-ups. And what's the difference? So a mix-up is basically any time you're forcing the opponent to make the correct defensive action or else they get hit. So for example, like I can do two lows here or I can do a low into an overhead and the opponent has to pick right. I'm either gonna block low if it's the low or I'm gonna block high if it's the overhead. Or, you know, maybe we can add another layer and mix in a throw as well. So there's kind of three different defensive ways that they have to deal with this situation, blocking low, blocking high, or getting thrown. But how is that different from a 50-50? So generally people tend to be pretty strict with the definition of a 50-50, meaning a 50-50 is when they have to guess there's a 50% shot they guess right at a 50% chance they guess wrong. So is this a 50-50, this thing we talked about? He's either gonna go low, low, or low overhead? It seems like it, right? Because you have to guess, low or high. But most people would not consider this a true 50-50 because it's fairly easy to option select your way out. So by defending low for like a split second and then switching to high, I can automatically block this. So you can see I'm able to block this 100% successfully just by sort of late moving my stick from down to high. Also, a lot of mix-ups can be somewhat reactable. So like him air dashing at me, yes, it forces me to block high, but it's not really a 50-50 between air dashing and just running up and going low because I can react. I can see the air dash coming. So that by itself is not enough to be a 50-50 because it's not really a 50% chance, I guess, right. It's much higher because I'm able to use my reactions and my defensive option selects to get out of the situation. So what is a true 50-50 then? Well, I would say command throws are a pretty easy example. Usually command throws are going to be completely unreactable and it's not like you can throw break or anything. So you can't do any kind of throw tech option selects to get out. So a lot of command throw characters can put you in a pretty true 50-50 where if you think the command throw is coming, you can try to jump out. But if you jump out, they can bait it by attacking you instead and hitting you out of your jump startup. So essentially 50% chance you either jump or you don't jump and a 50% chance you get it right. So that's a pretty true 50-50. Some characters have what's called try jumps. This can be a very pure 50-50 as well. You can see I can hit high or I can go low and hit low and it's basically near impossible to react to. So that's a pretty good 50-50 as well. And there are some cross-ups that are simply just so ambiguous and with the most minute changes in timing or what button you press when you're in the air, you can determine what side you end up on. There's also stuff like this Akuma cross-up where you can just jump and hit them on the front normally or you can jump and hit them on the back with a Tatsu. That's basically a 50-50 as well. So I think generally people are a little bit annoyed when you say like, look at this sick 50-50 I found. Uh, and then you post a video and it's some like super reactable mix up. So generally people are going to have sort of a higher standard of how unreactable and how option select proof something has to be to be considered a 50 50 versus just a mix up, which is a little bit more, you know, just doing a tick throw. That's a mix up. That's a little bit more normal or something like Akuma overhead. This is slightly reactable, but people would generally still call that a mix up because you are forcing the opponent to switch up what defense they use around else they get hit. All right, next up, we've got a handful of terms that I think are kind of used interchangeably sometimes or people don't understand the difference. We're going to be looking at neutral, zoning, spacing, and footsies. So first of all, let's talk about neutral. It's pretty simple. Neutral is any time 
where neither player is at an advantage. So anytime we're both just able to move and act freely, that's neutral. But as soon as I get a hit, we're no longer in neutral. As soon as I get a knockdown, we're no longer in neutral. As soon as I have you blocking something, we're not in neutral anymore because I have you in block stun. I'm at an advantage. But, you know, if you're able to guess right, block it out, certain moves are going to leave you back in like a neutral situation where, once again, neither player is at advantage. So that's neutral. Then we've got zoning. The idea of zoning is that you are trying to control the screen space and make the opponent take risks to get close to you. So a lot of characters are able to zone with fireballs. That's an obvious example. Some characters are able to zone with normal attacks as well. Like Dalsim is an obvious example. He can zone with fireballs or just with regular limbs. And generally the idea with zoning is you're trying to force the opponent into making some mistakes. So you're trying to make them take a risk like jumping or dashing or some other nonsense. And then you're able to punish them if they guess wrong on the approach. So that's the main idea with zoning. And then we've got spacing. Spacing is literally just trying to get into the right space where your moves are the most effective. So uh, with Ryu, his crouching medium kick is a really good move. So I'm gonna spend a lot of time walking around, trying to get into range where this crouching medium kick is going to hit at just the max range. A character like Dalsim, he's gonna wanna be, you know, moving back sometimes. He's gonna wanna be teleporting away and using spacing to try to get into range for his better normals. So depending on the character, spacing can look different depending on where their moves are most effective. And then finally, there's footsies. So footsies is kind of like an all-encompassing term for just the ground game. Anytime you're walking around on the ground using grounded normals, trying to get an advantage over the opponent using your movement and your attacks, that's going to be footsies. It's called footsies because especially in like Street Fighter, it like looks like you're kind of trying to like touch each other with with your toes. You know, you're playing you're playing footsies with each other. So that's why it's called footsies. But footsies is an aspect of neutral spacing is an aspect of footsies. So obviously to play footsies, you're going to want to try to get into the right spaces. You're going to try to want to stand in spaces where your character is effective, where you can hit with your moves. And then zoning can be a part of neutral as well. But zoning and footsies, not really the same thing. This zoning you're generally operating at sort of a long distance whereas footsies you're going to be operating just sort of at the the edge the the limit of where your normal attacks are going to connect so hopefully that explanation made sense these four things are very connected but they're not the exact same thing all right so next up i didn't see this one on twitter but this is one that has kind of bothered me from time to time and that's going to be pretzel motion so it seems like a lot of people use pretzel motion to describe basically any special move input that is really complicated or really hard. So for example, like Terry, when he was added to Smash, they carried over his Power Geyser input, which is gonna be quarter circle back, down back forward. So it looks kind of like this in motion. And a lot of people are like, wait, they added pretzel motions to Smash. Guys, this is not a pretzel motion. A pretzel motion is something very specific. Geese Howard is the one who has the pretzel motion. You do it like this to do his raging storm. And I'm going to show you the inputs here in Microsoft Paint. Okay, so if we imagine that this circle is sort of the joystick, there's the four cardinal directions. So the way this move works is you start at down back. And then you go up here to forward. And then you're going to do a half circle back. And you're going to go back down to down forward. And what does this look like? <laughs> Why, it looks like a beautiful, delicious pretzel. Here, I'll even show. When they want to show this move in, like, the command list, here's what they show you. And to me, that kind of looks like a pretzel. So that is where Raging Storm got its name from. Don't use this as just a shorthand for any sort of motion that is going to be difficult to do because it's not the same. A pretzel motion is something very specific. All right, so I've saved the worst one for last here. Let's talk about fuzzy. Fuzzy is a word that can mean just about anything that people want it to mean, but I'm gonna go chronologically. We're gonna start with the original meaning of the word, and then we're gonna go through kind of how that's changed over time and how people use it now. So originally this term comes from Virtua Fighter. It is an option select in Virtua Fighter that allows you to do one input that will let you escape many things, mid attacks and throws and sometimes lows as well. So the way it works is you double tap down forward and then you press guard and you'll see what happens is if you do this right, you'll block any mids the opponent does and you'll duck their throws. So it's an option select because you're doing one input and the game sort of automatically selects 
the correct response, whether it's ducking the throw or blocking the mid because of this technique, which is called fuzzy guarding. So that's where it came from. But then the meaning changed a little bit because fuzzy guarding can also mean that technique I talked about earlier where you block low and then you shift to blocking standing with a certain timing. And by using this, you'll sort of option select. Again, you're doing one input and you get two different results based on what the opponent does. So it's an option select where you'll either double block their low or if they do low into overhead, you will stand up and block the overhead at the last second. So this is also referred to as fuzzy guarding. And it's kind of similar, right? Because it's an option select where you do one thing and you'll automatically defend against multiple sort of mix-ups from the opponent. So that's also called fuzzy guarding. Not the exact same as in Virtua Fighter, but very similar. But people have taken this concept and taken the term fuzzy even further. So now it's generally applied to all kinds of different option selects, not just switching between low and standing guard, but doing all other kinds of defensive option selects. So let's imagine well, you block soul close standing slash. What's he going to do next? He's either going to do a far standing slash, very good move, or he's going to dash up throw you, right? So he's going to mix you up by either doing this, to beat you if you're trying to jump or press buttons, or he's gonna do this to beat you if you just try to block. So a type of option select that people would do to get out of this situation is they're gonna block for X amount of frames, and then at the last second, they're gonna jump. So you can see I start jumping, but because I'm already blocking his standing slash, I don't get hit by it out of my jump startup. But if he does dash up throw instead, the throw takes a little bit longer to come out, so I'm able to jump out. So I'm doing one response. I'm just gonna block and then at the last second I'm gonna jump and it gives me two different outcomes. Either I block or I jump depending on what the opponent does. So that's another type of defensive option select and people will call that a fuzzy jump. So at this point, this has like nothing to do with the Virtua Fighter technique that we came from other than the fact that it's a defensive option select where you're sort of in two states at the same time you're either jumping or you're stand blocking. You're kind of existing in those two states depending on what the opponent does. Kind of the same way where if you do a fuzzy guard where you block high at the last second, you're kind of in crouching block and standing block those two states at the same time depending on what happens. So that's the, the closest relation, but people will call that a fuzzy jump. And I know that wasn't confusing enough for you guys, but there's one other major definition for fuzzy, and that is forcing the opponent to stand so that they can get hit by instant overhead. So what does that mean that I just said? I know that was a lot of jargon, but here's what you need to know. So you remember that idea of an instant overhead, an attack that hits the opponent on the way up from a jump. Well, most of the time, characters don't have these because as you can see, if the character is crouching, they're too short and they can't be hit by your jumping attack. So what's the point of an overhead that whiffs on crouchers, right? That doesn't make sense. If if they can if they're standing, they're going to block it anyway. So it doesn't make sense that an instant overhead that whiffs on crouchers does anything. But there's an interesting aspect to standing and blocking in most fighting games. If you stand and block, your character will be stuck standing for a number of frames even if you're holding down back. So after he blocks my jump in, he is forced to stand up for a certain number of frames, which means, as you can see, he literally cannot duck that jumping heavy punch. His character is forced to stand. He can't duck it. Here, I'll show you from the other perspective. You can see that this Balrog jumping light kick, this will hit me if I'm standing. You can see it hits me on the way up, but if I'm ducking, it just whiffs over my head. But you can see if he does a jump in first, I actually get hit by it. Even though you can see on the on the joystick there that I'm holding down back, I actually get hit by the instant overhead because my character model is forced to stand. Even though I'm holding down back, the character literally cannot crouch. He's forced to stand, but I'm not stand blocking, so I get hit overhead. So that is called, you know, the aspect of being holding down back, but your character being forced to stand. People will call that a fuzzy guard or they will call the instant overhead itself a fuzzy overhead so this is completely different than the option selects and stuff we were talking about earlier it it has no connection other than there's this vague idea of you're kind of existing in two states at once you're standing and crouching at the same time so it, you're you're fuzz it's fuzzy 
whether you're standing or you're crouching. So this is just an accepted term now, even though it has zero relation to the fuzzy guard option selects that we talked about. This is just called a fuzzy now. And of course, in a game like Street Fighter, you don't get much off this. You just get one hit. So maybe it's only good to like close out the round. But in a game like, say, Dragon Ball Fighters, fuzzy overheads dominated the meta because they were a pure 50 50 that you just have to guess and you get a full combo off of with assists so don't underestimate the power of a fuzzy overhead and also don't be confused by the horrible horrible name but guys with that we're gonna be at the end of the list here this was a really difficult video to make so i hope you enjoyed it a lot of research and stuff went into it uh so hopefully it paid off let me know what you think down in the comments and if there's any other terms that you find confusing or you hear you hear people use wrong all the time post them in the comments so i can hear them so thank you so much for watching guys and i will see you in the next one